Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now then, at least uh, 18 months ago, when all we had to worry about was Trump and Brexit, we got rid of one of them, uh, we asked Deborah Ball, Baroness Ball, to deliver our annual Xmas lecture. It was going to be on the art of good health. It seemed like a very good idea at the time, but now we're nine months into COVID and the idea of talking to a blank screen became less and less attractive, certainly to Deborah. So we decided to change the format and make it into a double header instead. And so now you're going to get two for the price of one and have Deborah Bull and Daisy Fancourt in conversation about the art of good health. And myself will be playing the role of the blank screen. So good evening to both of you. And um, Deborah, as you were initially doing this on your own, would you like to kick off? And, and let's, um, let's start with, with uh, first of all, a quick introduction uh, to you. I mean, it actually, quick is not possible to do as someone like you, but uh, you are well known to a huge number of people from your work in the Royal Ballet from 1981. You became a principal, which became become a theme of your life by 92. You've been everywhere, danced everything. You left dancing in 2002, became a creative director all over the place. Well, mainly the Royal Opera. And then uh, finally, in 2015, you joined us as vice principal and vice president whilst pursuing a career in radio, TV, arts council, everything else and a Baroness in 2008. Now then, we also have Daisy next to you. Ah, almost as distinguished, and undoubtedly will be soon. Associate Professor, she won't be associate very long. Welcome Trust Fellow at UCL and a well-known researcher um, in, into the issues of mind, body and psychology. But I don't think I've ever met anyone with such a broad perspective as you have, a Renaissance woman. And I'm not going to list all the huge number of things you've also done on arts, health and um, uh, student health as well, policy uh, and all sorts of millions of things, and also setting up the largest study we have of COVID with apparently three minutes uh, on the clock. I need a drink from just introducing you both. Right, phew, thank God I've got that out of the way. Deborah, why don't you kick off then? So I suppose tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about your, your journey from being a principal ballerina into what you are now, a kind of uh, uh, a magisterial figure in the world of arts and health. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know if that's quite right, but um, <laughs> so you're right. My background is in ballet. As a ballet dancer, I started to train really, really young. So by the time I'd done 20 years as a professional, um, I was uh, still young enough to be considering uh, doing something <laughs> else. And my, my, my life uh, from being uh, a dancer really morphed into my life as creative director at the Royal Opera House. Um, I was particularly interested in how a big institution with a long history remains relevant, permeable, connected. Um, and uh, that's a theme that's run a bit through my life. So in my work as a governor at the BBC, and then of course, after being creative director at the Opera House for 12 years, I moved to King's and some King's College London, a big institution with a long history, like all institutions, a tendency to work in silos, a tendency to look inwards. Not up. All of these themes are, are, are common to what I've what I've um, been doing, really. Um, so so that's how I got to King's. Um, the interest in the role of arts in health. Uh, doesn't go quite so far back. It goes really back to when I began my life as a professional dancer in the ballet company. Um, so, so having been, um, you know, one of the stars of the school, I joined the back row of the corps de ballet. And, you know, truth be told, I was a little bit bored actually, but rather brilliantly, a project came along which was sponsored by a drug company to take ballet into hospitals and hospices in order to, I mean, it was, the aim was really simple, take ballet to these people because these people couldn't come to the ballet, they were, they were, they were in, in, in care setting. Should just introduce an embarrassing picture of you. Oh, are Let's you going to do that? No, yes, I think we can, <laughs> I think we can, the miracles of uh, arts and science. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I'm quite fond of those pictures. So those pictures are from a publication, I think, called, ooh, The Northern Palette Island Practice. Yes. Is it called, is it something called like that? that? Yeah. Um, something like that. So, so that's me and Mark Silver 
And this is slightly later on. This is when I was actually a principal dancer. And we went over to, to, to Belfast and performed in a, a series of, as you can see, very unsuitable environments to perform ballet. I mean, that is indeed a carpet. And that is indeed a, you know, a, a, a visitor's room or a waiting room and, and there isn't there is a piano as you can see and we became really very good at adapting the choreography of Swan Lake to fit in unsuitable spaces but the reason I hark back to this moment is um, we we performed in the 80s we were performing in a hospice and I was asked to go and speak to one of the patients and I went there and I talked about my costume and my headdress and it was a you know to me the normal sort of conversation you would have with somebody who's seen the ballet and as I walked away the the matron said thank you so much for doing that this patient hasn't spoken since she's arrived but she talked to you and it was a really profound experience because I knew that something had happened I knew that, that some there had been some impact of of the art but I had no way of knowing exactly what had happened and why it had happened, because of course there was no research attached to this project. There was no, none of the rigor that Daisy might have brought to us. You know, we were just going along doing our ballet class and doing our performance. But it really set in, in me this niggling curiosity. Could art make a difference? If so, how? And crucially, what is it about the art bit that makes the difference? Um, you know, could I have gone along and done something else? Could I have gone along and talked to these people? Could I have gone along and done a knitting class? Would that have been the same? And it was these sort of questions that really um, stayed with me throughout my time at the Opera House. Um, I saw similar impact in education settings. I saw similar impact when we, we worked uh, with prisoners and parole prisoners, but all the time I didn't really know. And it was this curiosity to understand much more about the art that I'd practiced for so long, which was one of the things that drove me to King's because I wanted to be closer to an environment where these sort of questions were being asked. Okay, and so you're also closer to another environment where the questions have been asked by people like Daisy, just the, the godless heathens, as we call them, uh, quoting the Duke of Wellington, up the road at UCL. So Daisy, how can, how you, you surely must have some background in performance or art. You can't possibly have done all the things you have just randomly. I do, I have background as a pianist um, before working within science, but I, I think it's interesting how many people within medicine and within health we find who've got this passion and this often double life working um, or having experience within the art sector. And I think it really highlights that link that we're seeing between arts and medicine increasingly. Yes, well, you've got, you've got, you've got a treble or quadruple life, I think would be one way of putting it, uh, and both of you do, and it's uh, very nerve-wracking having you both on screen, completely outnumbered here. But so it's it, it certainly, you know, when, when oh, years ago, um, I would say we didn't talk much about arts and health. Um, there was the work, and then some people had uh, different lives, but they didn't interact that much in, in your average medical career of bringing them together. Daisy, would you like to kind of sketch a little bit about how this field has grown and, uh, you know, just, just the kind of range in way, ways in which art's been used within health? Well, it's interesting that actually historically, if we look back on some of the earliest evidence of the arts from 40,000 years ago, the evidence that we find actually suggests that art then was being used within health and healing contexts. For example, fertility rituals, rituals designed to support around funerals or bereavements, or it's supposed to enhance social bonding or, or, or community well-being. Now we can trace this across medical traditions all over the world. Obviously what we were seeing wasn't always actually scientific or achieving the kinds of aims that people thought they were achieving. But over the last few decades, we've really started to have good quality evidence coming through about how the and why the arts affect us. And I've worked with the World Health Organization over the last couple of years, and we've been doing a scoping review, trying to understand the breadth of the evidence base to date. And we found over three and a half thousand studies that have been carried out. <laughs> Which was your favorite one? <laughs> oh, God, I possibly pick from that. But, I mean, obviously, oh, yeah. there is an, an, a natural variability in the quality of this evidence, but we seem to be seeing that as the years are progressing, the quality is getting better. I think as the evidence base is growing, the size of the research grants going into this is increasing, the number of scientists wanting to work in this area is going up as well. And the evidence base seems to be split across two broad areas. 
one of which is looking at how the arts supports in the management or treatment of health conditions. So for example, helping people with the management of mental health condition symptoms, helping people who've got neurological or neurodevelopmental disorders with things like communication or emotional expression, helping in acute healthcare settings with things like anxiety, stress hormones, immune function. And we're also seeing that there's uh, evidence looking more at the role of the arts in prevention and health promotion. So arts helping in things like education, helping with social bonding, helping with health communication and helping to actually spread critical health messages and also supporting in the training and well-being of healthcare professionals. So it feels like we've got the arts here directly addressing some medical challenges, but also helping to address some of those social determinants of health that we're seeing given so much more prominence over the last few years. That's quite a list. Well, Deborah, what would you like to kick off in this list of, of, uh, of, of the, the, broad, the, the numerous possibilities out there? Otherwise, we'll, we'll be here till tomorrow. No, well, I think I think that's that's right. And I mean, I should say one of the things that uh, when I got to King's um, and uh, I, I was, as I say, I was really keen to get, you know, get under the skin of this evidence. And what I discovered was that to a non-academic, it was totally impenetrable. This was for two reasons. One is because it was often behind a paywall. And second, because it was written <laughs> in a language uh, that was literally impenetrable if you, if you, you, you know, you don't have the training. So, so we developed something called Culture Case, which is a web portal that, that, brings peer-reviewed um, research uh, through translation to a wider audience. And in fact, you know, as Daisy says, by far the biggest category, we had um, you know, the impact of um, arts and culture on education, placemaking, urban you know, renewal, et cetera, et cetera. The biggest, uh, the biggest category was, was arts and health by far. You know, this is, this is where researchers have been really, really interested. So what I found at King, what we've been trying to do at King's, and I'll, I'll speak about, you know, a few of the smaller scale things we've done there, because, you know, in addition to, to everything da Daisy said, there's also a really valuable role in communicating our um, healthcare messages through arts, I mean, particularly where language is a, bar is a barrier, um, and in enhancing healthcare environments. Um, uh, so we know, of course, you know, we know about paintings on walls, and we know about, you know, music and you know, in waiting rooms and so on. But one of the, the projects that we, we um, explored, which I really loved, was, uh, was uh, translate, creating of an MRI scanner, an environment which was less frightening for children and people um, on, on the autism spectrum. So, so, so using a, a partnership with a, with a puppet company to create of an MRI scanner, a, um, a rocket, a space rocket, so that the child was 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 uh, was part of a narrative in which they were going on a trip to the moon. They were not not having the scan. So so there are lots and lots of these these little projects. But I think the one I might like to talk about, um, which is, is sort of close to my heart, is is dance for Parkinson's, uh, because it does bring um, bring uh, you know bring dance, which is the primary art form I was en engaged in. Um, and it is it is one of the um, uh, interventions which has been rolling out for quite a long time. I mean, I think it goes back to 2001 in New York when the Mark Morris Dance Company was approached by, by a local group to to develop this in intervention with with ballet classes, and it's now grown to the point point where it's taking place in 25 countries throughout the world. Um, and I think what's what's interesting uh, uh, about it is we know that physical evidence, the physical exercise, is a very positive intervention for for people with Parkinson's. But there hasn't been very much research to date on the impact of exercising in groups as a as opposed to exercising on your own. And of course, the whole essence of a ballet class is you do it as a group. So one of the projects that we're taking forward um, with, with UCL and, and Kings actually in, that, in the, the, the big scale up project that, that we're doing. Um, but it's, it's it, yes, it, it's one of the ones I, I, I would point to as having a good evidence base, but, but needing, um, you know, needing to be trialed much more at scale to see whether it really is an effective um, adjunct treatment uh, for people living with, with Parkinson's. Okay, well, uh, Irina uh, Roncaglia, who's a former soloist for the English National Ballet, has just 
um, obviously asked a question which in fact just answered as you're going on about what has Dance for Health been doing in, in, in conditions such as Parkinson's and cancer patients. So uh, um, I don't know if you, you may know her in fact, I'm not sure. But, but let's, let's drill down a little bit more on that. So Daisy, you, you in, in one way, you, you're there really to kind of, I always think kind of, kind of crush the artistic Deborah on the wheel of science uh, with your, you know, with uh, your bringing in trials and all this uh, stuff. So what, you, you're fascinated by the mechanisms in which this happens. So let's take this example of dance and movement disorders, Parkinson's disorders, et cetera. What, what work would you be doing or have done to elucidate what, what, what is it that goes on in between, as it were? Well, over the last year, I've been working with my research team. We've been trying to identify what these mechanisms are because people have proposed there could be uh, maybe six, 10, 20 mechanisms that explain yes. how the arts affect health. We've actually just finished a review that's being published in Lancet Psychiatry very shortly. And we've found there have been over 600 different mechanisms actually. Oh my connected. God, which was your favorite? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, connecting arts and other leisure activities with mental and physical health outcomes. And these seem to be split across psychological, biological, social and behavioral mechanisms. So if we're picking up on this example here of dance Parkinson's, yeah. then as Deborah mentioned, there are some aspects of this that might be quite similar to physical activity. So this would be some of those um, uh, biological or physical mechanisms. So it might be helping with things like mobility, helping to build strength, um, helping uh, people with hand-eye coordination or the, the smoothness of their movements. And we often see with um, Parkinson's in dance an improvement in things like gait. But at the same time, it's also tackling lots of other issues that we know can be problematic for people with Parkinson's disease. So by having it in a group setting, we're bringing in these social elements. So connecting people to others who might have the same condition that could help to reduce loneliness or stigma, build up social support networks, all of which have been shown to be very strongly linked in with our mental and physical health outcomes. And then psychologically, it also might be building things like confidence and well-being, helping to reduce symptoms of depression or anxiety, helping people to feel more resilient and cope. And finally, behaviorally, we often find that when people start a new activity like the arts, because of that combination of things like increased self-esteem, for example, or increased social networks, people might actually have built up the confidence to go and try something else new as well. So we often find that people joining arts activities will also join other arts activities or other community groups. And they also might even become more health conscious and improve other health aspects of their lives. So what might seem like a fairly small activity of joining a dance for Parkinson's group once a week could actually trigger quite monumental changes across lots of different aspects of people's lives that could add up to have this overall impact on health. And I think there's also there's also a point, isn't there, to Daisy, about adherence, because if you're doing something that you enjoy rather than something that you're told to do because it's good for you, um, I, I I think I'm right. Am I, am I right, or are you going to tell me I'm not? That the 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 adherence of of the patients within the trials is is pretty remarkable. It is. I've heard the phrase that arts and health is a bit like arts and stealth in that the arts can be this vehicle for bringing a lot of these different health promoting benefits that I've just listed. But because people are doing it for the often for largely the joy of it, this can mean that it doesn't necessarily feel like a medical intervention, but feels like a positive part of their lives that happens to be having these medical benefits. So the motivational component can be quite a bit stronger than we might find for more traditional and let's say less creative healthcare treatments. I mean, in the, I, mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't read your Lancet paper, I read the, the other review you had, uh, your very prolific uh, last month. And in the end, you were concluding that, you know, engaging with specific and multiple processes that meet our individual needs and circumstances. I mean, is a bit, you know, it's kind of all too all encompassing, isn't it, Daisy? Does that help very much? I see uh, your point there in that, you know, if you're, if you're doing this, is, is it triggering everything and therefore is it kind of triggering nothing as a result in what's special about this? Yeah. But we, we've got a lot of evidence now from trials and also from epidemiological studies that there, there seems to be something about this creative engagement that has benefits of, above and beyond other activities that we might do in our lives. And we're actually seeing, you know, across the long term, people who have been more creatively engaged, they're actually having better 
mental and physical health outcomes long term as well as in the short term. And of course, we naturally might suppose that those people who are happy to take part in Dance for Parkinson's might be the ones who were doing better health wise anyway, or were from higher socioeconomic positions, they're more privileged or having other kinds of attributes that could explain these benefits. But even when we're taking these into account in quite complex and sophisticated statistical models, we're still seeing these benefits long term. So I, I feel like there is something about the arts here that's important for us to be pursuing from research perspective, because it seems to be coming out as an important health promoting activity. But would, would you say then it's similar to, I'm going to go and watch Chelsea play Leeds this Saturday for the first time in a year. Um, is that, would you say then that's an arts intervention? That's not an arts intervention, but it is part of a leisure intervention. In fact, the review that we've got coming out looked at leisure broadly because whilst the arts have got some components that you might not see to the same extreme or in the same way, for example, particularly the creativity that you see within arts activities, there are lots of other components of the arts that might be shared. So going to watch football team play, for example, has got a lot of that shared social engagement. It's got that team spirit. It's got that collective feeling like you're striving to a goal, even though you're just watching someone else striving towards that goal. <laughs> so I feel like um, that there are lots of these similarities in leisure behaviours that, that need to be appreciated more to connect arts with other things like volunteering, community groups, etc. But all of these things are things that we need to be thinking about more seriously in relation to health. And of course, the, the downside is if we lose, that will then have a negative impact on my well-being. So it's not quite the same. But uh, OK, so the, let, let's, um, let, let's, Deborah, do you, do you want to talk a bit, a bit more? Again, I'm, I'm fascinated by the way that, that already Daisy's moved into language of multivariate statistics and, and very complicated statistics. And you were saying that, you know, you couldn't even get past our paywalls, uh, <laughs> even to, even to, to read a paper like that, like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and 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 that's um, definitely not my role. That you know, Daisy and her colleagues are, are much better mm. placed to do that. I think um, I think you know my my role has been in convening some of these these conversations and trying to push push this agenda forwards. I mean, when I think back to my own um, you know my own history and and the things that I've been interested in, I've I have always been um, been trying to push the understanding of of the science behind the arts um, and and how and how they have their impact. You know what are what are the processes that are going on within the artist, but also within the audience, in order to 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 make that connection. And that's that's been a kind of theme. And when I um, when I arrived at the university, you know, specifically with a remit to find ways in which. Uh, the cultural opportunities in London could be of benefit to the staff and students at King's and vice versa. Um, uh, what, what, I, what I discovered was that there was a huge interest. Um, it was a it, it was it was a dispersed, but it was a but there were lots of people across the health faculties who were, who were really interested in exploring the potential for collaborations with artists or cultural organizations both within research in order to stimulate new ways of thinking or to uh, find new ways to communicate research ideas through artistic collaborations and also within, within, within education. Um, and the some of the, some of the I mean, I, I've always thought artists are a little bit like researchers in that they are also seeking answers to questions but they do it in very, very different ways and they, do, they have very different methods of, of doing it. So, so artists, they tend to, um, they unite the head and the hand. Um, they're perhaps more extinct, instinctive. They take leaps of faith um, rather than, than, than building necessarily on evidence. These are terrible generalizations, by the way, but I think they're generalizations no. that, 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 uh, that people would recognize. Um, and, and, but they are acute observers of human behavior. You know, artists are acutely observing behavior all the time. And that's absolutely what researchers are doing. So where I found my role um, was really in trying to create the spaces where uh, the, the artists and the scientists could come together. Um, and that was literally about spaces sometimes, but it was also about finding translation across languages, uh, translation across timescales, 
the other big difference between the two communities are in budgets. So, I mean, if you're getting a, you know, 150,000 pounds a year as a small arts company, you'll think you're doing pretty well. If you're a researcher, you might think that's a relatively small grant, right? Um, <laughs> By um, days and standards, then, it is. <laughs> and uh, there's also something about the the time scale and um, the duration of focus. So, so researchers are very happy to put their head down for three years to explore something incredibly detailed. Arts organizations rarely have the luxury of doing that. So, 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 so um, I, I used to say, you know, it would be nice if artists could keep their heads down for a bit longer. And sometimes it would be nice if researchers could lift their heads occasionally and look around them. Um, but there is this, this difference in the sort of, the sort of focus. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the place where it all came together for, for, um, for uh, around this, this sort of connections were, um, was with the Creative Health Report. So I don't know if Daisy yet mentioned it, but uh, the Creative Health Report came out of the All Party Parliamentary Group for Arts, Health and Wellbeing. And it was a, a really substantial report, which, you know, to sort of uh, really summarize the landscape at the moment. But it came out very clearly saying that uh, there was a need uh, to scale up um, the, to, to, to try all these things at scale if they were ever going to be taken seriously mm -hmm. within, uh, within clinical commissioning and within the NHS. And uh, it really, it, this opportunity really grew out of a conversation where I was asked, what is the tech transfer office for small scale arts in health interventions? And at that point, I had literally just understood, having worked at Kings for five years, exactly what an academic health sciences center was. <laughs> and it dawned on me that actually the tech transfer office is something like King's Health Partners because it is a portal between a, a community of people, this one in South London, and a university and a university, a network of universities. Um, and it can be the place where these things are translated or, or the technology is transferred more broadly. So um, I was really excited about doing that because having worked to bring together the sort of the health and the and the arts at, at King's for so long and having really worked to try and understand um, how King's and King's health partners and Daisy might say something about UCL and UCL partners you know what is the connection we will between let her. We, what, what is the connection between you know this 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 university and 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 the and the trust that of which the trust that sit alongside it um, and so I was excited about that and we got a very enthusiastic reception from the King's health partners board which was aided in no small part by Daisy's fantastic presentation where she talked to, you know, about her work and about, and about the potential. So it was really from that that we were successful in getting the award from Welcome uh, to scale up uh, or to try and at scale three interventions that have been successful um, on, the, on the smaller scale, one of which is, is Dance for Parkinson's. So Daisy, we owe our success to you then, I hear. <laughs> I'd Hopefully love no one will hear that at UCL. <laughs> So Daisy, to take take that story further, then. So this is about this is about the difficulties. I mean, you can, I can, you know, we've often done things in the South of the River. We've often had enthusiastic colleagues who have a particular interest in something, or film, or art, or poetry, etc. But they they seem to last for as long as that particular colleague's enthusiasm lasts, or for as long as they stay with us. They they very rarely seem to to follow on. Is that, how do we get around that problem, Daisy? Yes, I think this is an important problem. I think it's partly driven from the fact that lots of the funding for arts-based projects and communities is often short term, mm -hmm. which means that a project will come last for six months or a year and then go away. And of course, that makes it challenging both to look at the researching the long term impact, but also to mean that effective programmes actually can then get embedded and continue to be delivered within practice. But I think that there are promising signs over the last few years that are supporting this scale up and roll out of, of longer term activities. And I think by far the most prominent of these is the rollout of social prescribing within the uh -huh. NHS. So the means by which GPs can now refer their patients directly to link workers, who will be people within the practice who will be well connected with opportunities in the community, whether that's dance for Parkinson's groups or other kinds of arts or social or community support activities, and can then actually help that patient to, to connect with these activities and have that longer term engagement. And what this is really providing is a kind of model by which patients can be directly referred into the arts and also back again. 
And the reason this is so helpful is because it gives this kind of longer term stability for programs to develop and continue having points of contact with the healthcare sector. But even if one encouraged and enthusiastic medic leaves, there's still the infrastructure in place for that kind of program to keep running. But what it also provides, which I think is really crucial, is the chance for local adaptation, because one of the virtues of arts activities is they can be adapted to whatever the local need is, whether that's a local place based need around the demographics of the people there or a health related need with the kinds of health conditions that people are presenting with. To the but make it feel more real. Give some examples of this in action. So, for example, we've been seeing a lot of literature coming out about the benefits of shared reading for people who have mental health conditions. But of course, it's going to vary depending on what kind of books are suitable to be using in this activity based on whether you've got younger or older people, what part of the country you're based in, the demographics and cultural backgrounds of those people engaging. And it's also going to depend on what kinds of spaces, whether there are libraries available or whether this is running within GP practices themselves. And that's the kind of local adaptation that arts organizations can make within that infrastructure of social prescribing. And that's what I think makes it so promising because it can be tailored yet still having a consistent model across the UK. Now, someone's already asked, follow the money. Who pays for this? Well, at the moment for social prescribing, what tends to be happening is we've got this sort of dual model where the health sector, we're putting money into the health side of it. So the link right. work, we're doing the referrals, but then it relies on the art sector having the funding to fund the arts activities. And I guess naturally the art sector doesn't just want to be an instrument of health and end up solely funding health related arts programs. And I think as well, particularly with the last year where we've seen very detrimental effects on the arts sector, there are questions around, will there be the we'll Come on to that. <laughs> will there be activities for people to be referred to? So I'd say it's still a work in progress in setting up those models in a way that actually jointly funds across the entire pathway for patients. Well, I mean, let's come on to it now then. There was an item on the Today programme, um, oh, I think it was Monday, uh, of singers, opera singers who were being paid, I think, by, by relatives who can't visit their, their family and care homes. And they would then pay for, for the, uh, the singer to, to, to do a kind of live concert on Zoom, obviously, um, of their favourite uh, songs. Um, now, it sounded a great idea. And, but, you, but you also sense a certain element of desperation in a lot of people not working who are you know, really struggling. And, and I mean, I don't quite know how to follow this up, but if, if, if life returns to normal, they would then perhaps go back to the Royal Opera and you wouldn't see that again. But uh, is that, is that uh, happening more, do you think, Derek? Do you think that we're, some of these things are happening just because we've got so just an army of unemployed, highly creative people who aren't working? Well, there's lots of problems wrapped up in that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, um, so arts organisations typically, typically, the people who would deliver these interventions are not just unemployed opera singers, although you know, they may be able to do that. But the people who are working on, uh, for instance, who are teaching the, the, the Parkinson's um, dance classes, they are, of course, dance teachers, but they are specialist dance teachers who, who have you know, certain skills and, and techniques and trainings to, to, do, to do these things. Um, so some arts organizations have developed in order to specifically to to support arts in health I mean I think of something like breathe um, uh, breathe which was a spin out from guys and Thomas's charity mm -hmm. which is entire it's an arts organization that's entirely focused on arts in health and health interventions other people like English National Ballet who run um, their own dance for Parkinson's program they employ a specific artists to 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 deliver that um, so whether whether we are get, whether there is indeed the the money to to simply employ people you know as as you suggest um, those those industries probably are popping up but I think they're very much parallel to the kinds of things that we're talking about which are structured um, structured programs that are um, part of the, the broader health care and health intervention offer. And I, I mean, I think one of the things to, 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 to stress is, is one of the questions that we're exploring within the research is, are these things cost effective? Um, because, uh, you know, if, if these are, 
you know, as effective ways of, of treat, treating people with for certain conditions, then actually you don't have to make the argument where, where's the money coming from, because actually they, they might represent a cost saving down the line. So, so one of the elements of, of the shape of project is there's, a, there's an implementation science strand, which is looking at exactly that question, you know, are these things implementable? Um, and and are they are they cost effective as well as are they clinically effective? I mean, Deborah, you you've spent a good part of your career defending the arts as being cost effective, uh, making the case for well, you have making the case for. Well, I, think, arts. I defend their value. <laughs> yeah, I just I was about to say, do you think you're just doing the same thing but just changing the language? I mean, you famously lectured on why it was important to support elite arts. You you made no secret of the fact that you felt it was. I just wondered if you Actually, just... I think I think um, sorry. I, I think I um, argued that um, that um, arts are practiced by people who are elites, just as psychiatry and medicine is practiced by people who are elites. But the <laughs> the art forms are not elite. Uh, I think that was the I think that was the point the point I was making. Um, so, what's your question? Nicely I'm done. Making... <laughs> Shall I just stop there? No, no, go on. Yes. <laughs> so. so um, so your, your question was whether I'm just making the same arguments with changing the language. Yes, I was just wondering, you know, a little bit like that, yes. And, uh, you know, normally when we, when we, and I've noticed that when things are really important, like, like no one's asking if, if the vaccine is cost effective, are they? Or if we're doing for COVID. I notice that we tend to fall back on that when, when, we, when we're feeling a little, um, what's the word, in, in trouble, as it were. Daisy, would you do you agree with that? You know, no, no, no one is asking what's the cost effectiveness of the current things that we're doing, um, which are, you know, in fact, the opposite, they're ruining the economy. But we're not I having those discussions. Often what we see within arts and health work is that the arts programs have been developed to address a very specific clinical need where there right. isn't currently a clinical solution or isn't currently a cost effective one. So if we talk about social prescribing, then we know that around 20 to 30 percent of GP visits are not for medical reasons. They're for broader social factors like loneliness, for example. Uh -huh. So we don't have an adequate medical offering for those patients without social prescribing. But social prescribing in arts activities has been shown to actually reduce the number of GP appointments that people are then booking, perhaps unnecessarily, but also helping people to get off, for example, longer term medication because they're finding alternative ways to cope with things like mental health or chronic pain, etc. Right. This evidence of cost savings is starting to come in quite clearly now for a range of interventions and social prescribing in primary care is just one example. We're seeing the same kinds of things in acute care too. Do you want to give, give again? It's always nice to have examples. I love examples. I think we're seeing, for example, that uh, perioperative anxiety can cause problems in terms of operative complications, but also in terms of the costs of pain medication for patients. And especially in the US, there's been a lot of research about how the arts prior to surgery, like listening to music, can help to reduce stress levels and actually reduce the amount of medication that's needed. And there have been a large number of studies synthesized in meta-analyses now showing that the cost savings from something as simple as playing recorded music can be quite substantial in terms of these drug reductions and even reductions in the length of hospital stay. In fact, talking about recorded music, Daisy, I noticed you also did a study on surgeons playing music. Um, Good. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed there was a little item a few weeks ago I did pick up that uh, study by Spotify, who presumably have a reason for doing this, said that 90% of UK surgeons play uh, music in, in the operating theatre um, and it's supposed to relax or, well, I assume it does or whatever. Um, tell, tell us about your study. That must have been a curious thing to do. It was. We were very interested in this concept of whether playing recorded music during surgery was beneficial there were lots of studies claiming it was beneficial to surgeons, surgical techniques, but whether this was a sort of surgeon specific thing, as in the type of people who go to be surgeons, are they somehow responding particularly well to music? Or was this part of human nature where listening to music when you're doing complex surgical tasks could actually help your performance? Now, obviously, no one was going to give us the ethics to put a whole bunch of untrained people from the public performing surgery in operating theatres. So we had to mock up an operating theatre involving noise cancelling headphones with lots of beeping sounds, uh, scrubs and the game operation. And we found that there was indeed some evidence. We ran a very complicated three arm single blind randomised control trial 
Uh, so we were doing this with excellent quality science. Um, but we found there was some evidence that classical music did slightly improve people's skill, uh, accuracy and speed of operating. But we found that for men, if they listened to rock music whilst they were operating, it had a rather disastrous effect on their surgical skills. But they felt they were performing just as well as they had been without the music. All right. Well, according to Spotify, it's 50% of surgeons play rock music. I, I did notice also, though, on the same theme that uh, an imperial study said the choice of music must be made by the entire team. And they've obviously never been into an operating theatre. What music would you play in an operating theatre, Deborah? I think it would have to be the first cut is the deepest, wouldn't it? <laughs> I was thinking of staying alive myself. What's about you? Wake, What's about you, up Daisy? You go, girl. I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah. our choice for the study was um, the Razor's Edge ACDC. Oh, no. Okay. Sure. Oh, all right. Or smooth up. Okay, we'll talk about that. I want to come back to your point because I, okay. you I think you were asking me whether it was necessary, or maybe you weren't, to, to justify the arts on the basis that they contributed to other. Yeah, yes, I, I was asking you that. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I've never been uncomfortable about that. Um, so, so, so there's a question about, um, you know, art in itself does not need to be justified, but there is a, but, but there's also a question about, about taxpayer money and whether that needs to be justified. So, so I've never been uncomfortable in art having multiple purposes, as long as it's really good art. Um, so, so I do think art has its intrinsic value, which might be about personal transformation, um, uh, all of which is, is valuable, but, but it has, can have secondary impacts, which, which have social value, or indeed health value, or educational value. And I've never really been uncomfortable in making those arguments. So, um, so this is an extension of that. But as Daisy says, these are very specific interventions. We're not just saying everybody should go to the Royal Opera House and watch me dance Swan Lake and that it's going to cure them of, of all ills. These are very specific interventions um, within, you know, within a treatment package. So it's not arts for art's sake then. It was Gautier, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, it so depends what the sake of art is. <laughs> <laughs> There, Daisy, come on, you're, come on, come in on this one. I think that what we're seeing in the research on this is that there are these two aspects to it. You can engage in very specific arts programs developed with a specific health or clinical aim. But we also now know that just general arts engagement in everyday life for the joy of it, like going to watch Swan Lake, these mm -hmm. things can have health benefits, especially around that prevention and health promotion angle. So we're not arguing that the arts have to be for health in order to be good for health. Arts generally can also be for health's sake. Okay, so if, if that's the case, then should we not be teaching or bringing our young medical students more into this field? Uh, than certainly was the case when I was. How should we be doing that? Deborah, you've been doing stuff on this at King's, I assume. I think. Well, yes. I mean, um, we we have. So, I mean, I don't need to tell you either of you to um, that there the are education. Other people on the call. Well, there are. That's true. <laughs> that's true. Hello, everyone. Um, that the education of medical professions uh, professionals has, you know, largely been focused on science, and 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 it, mm -hmm. it tends to, um, uh, you, know, you know, to to prioritise. Te technicalities and 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 um, over things like the patient experience um, or or the perception perception of the patient experience and what we've seen at its worst is that this leads to a absence of empathy and and absence of the ability to communicate effectively with patients um, and I think what we're finding through uh, through the, the the research that's coming through is that. Uh, that there is there is evidence to, to show that arts-based learning can help develop those skills um, ar around the expertise. So areas like critical thinking, uh, dealing with uncertainty, effectively communicating, um, empathy, cultural competence, um, dealing with with change, um, and that that finding ways within the education to deliver um, arts-based learning um, is valuable. So one of the things that's uh, really taken hold at King's is a program we, which is called Clinical Humanities for Dental Undergraduates. Mm -hmm. And this is in our Faculty of, of Dentistry, Oral, oral and um, Craniofacial Sciences. 
and it it really is intending to build uh, the students' uh, confidence in dealing with patients, uh, their uh, observation skills, um, the way they deal with ambiguity, um, and so they they work uh, they they visit galleries, they work with actors um, uh, and and, uh, and with screenwriters to explore. Uh, decision making, and that's now being that's now embedded in the curriculum. So it is it is one of the programs. Another that um, was a, a little pilot, but um, it used stand up comedy. Um, the, the idea being that culture is 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 very pre um, culture humor is very prevalent uh, in 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 within within medical students. But there's a, a <laughs> culture less so. Culture less though, um, but um, who knows? But uh, there's a there's a rather closed atti attitude towards mental health issues. So students are not very happy talking about their own um, their own issues of stress and anxiety and mental health. Even though we know that um, there is a, a there is a problem around students who are under so much pressure. So the stand up comedy program aimed to harness the culture of humour to encourage students to talk about their own mental health and to, to access the services available. So those are two ways in which um, it's, it's both embedded in the curriculum, but also around the curriculum to support the broader student experience. Mm. Well, at the moment, that, that would seem to be a good thing, looking at the latest figures on mental health of the workforce. Daisy, yeah. from, from your perspective, slightly north of us, dealing with, again, I, I've, I've been lecturing on MBBS programs for a number of years now, and I think something that seems to be coming across really clearly is the appetite for innovation amongst the up and coming medical students and junior mm. doctors, but also their, their growing appreciation, I think, and recognition of these social determinants of health as well as the medicine itself. And I think when we look at social prescribing, returning to that as an example, there are now whole networks for social prescribing student ambassadors around the country who want to get involved in this. We've got more and more uh, MBBS programs that are doing placements within primary care, giving students the chance to see this work in action. And we're also seeing more students who are actually part of clinical entrepreneurship programs, trying to develop new creative ideas. And I think that this appetite for innovation means that this generation of doctors coming are particularly excited about the opportunities of these aspects within medicine and really see their value. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what they do with this over the next few years and whether we start to see other programmes like social prescribing coming in, making the most of arts and creativity to address other health challenges. Yeah, I mean, certainly our neuroscientists, I notice are incredibly um, innovative in, in harnessing arts to, to describe, to, uh, and neurosciences seem to come together, not least in the most extraordinary visual imagery I've ever seen. And uh, that certainly didn't used to happen. Um, yeah. So, I think um, on, sorry, come in, Barry. Yeah. I, was, I was only going to add, um, uh, to, to just reflect on what Daisy was saying about the, the entrepreneurial ideas that are coming, coming through and uh, the, the, the need for creative thinking um, and to be able to think outside the box in order to develop those ideas um, is, another, is another way in which um, the art, arts-based learning, which uh, encourages people to think laterally, to think differently, to make alternative connections, to see things from other perspectives, is really key in, in driving those, that innovative thinking that will deliver those new solutions. Okay, innovative. So, looking to the future, then more innovation. What what would be the, if we, what would be the, what would you most like to see changing then in in the way this um, I don't know what we call it really movement I suppose uh, is developing. <laughs> what would we call it anyway? What would you what would you most like to see? It, it is kind of a movement, isn't it? I, I mean, think it is. Yes. I mean, you know, ref reflecting back over the last um, uh, thirty years, really seeing the, the 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 evidence base growing, seeing the policy landscape shifting, mm. you know, seeing the first uh, the first sort of reports coming out that start to mention the role of of, of arts and culture within health, um, seeing the way the then the Arts Council and the Department of Health came together. I mean, these are really quite recent actually they are quite recent yeah. but to have had the national um academy for social prescribing uh, set up and indeed the national center for creative health which was established in 
only in July this year. So it is a particular moment. And I think for, for me, the challenge is sustainability. I mean, particularly in the light of all of the other pressures that are on the system. And, mm. um, and so if this, is, if this is perceived as a nice to have, you know, this is, this is the same old story about the arts, actually. It's been, you know, throughout my life, actually. If it's seen as a nice to have, as something we do in good times, as, you know, a little project along on the side, then it will be the thing that stops when, when times are tough. Yeah. Actually, right now, times are tough. So yeah. how do we bring this into the mainstream? How do we demonstrate the efficacy, the effectiveness? Um, it is the really, really key question, which is which is why I'm you know excited about having this conversation. I'm excited about you know the work the work that's going on. But yeah. it only takes a you know a change in the political landscape. Um, Sorry about the noise. For these off. things yeah. to be cut off at the um, at the pass. Daisy, what's your perspective on that? I guess the thing that excites me is about the, the application of cutting edge scientific methods to understanding more about how the arts affect health. So in the last decade, we've seen a phenomenal uh, advancement in the use of neuroscience methods for understanding how the arts affect the brain, yep. being um, uh, studies using biological data and physiological measurements to see how the arts affect our bodies. Uh, and within my team, we've been using a lot of big data and actually starting to look at these population um, effects over, over decades. And we're now even looking at things like how arts engagement might modify the link between genetic risk factors and the actual clinical outcomes that people have, or how engaging in the arts could affect epigenetics, how we're sort of turning on and off our genes for different health conditions. So I feel like these wow. sort of scientific frontiers are going to be completely revolutionizing how we understand the health benefits of the arts in the coming years. I see a huge welcome project grant coming there, <laughs> if, if ever I saw one. Wow, that's, um, that's really far more uh, leaping ahead than I thought you'd be doing, yeah. I was just thinking of the first time I went to our MSc students who now, I think they all have to do an arts project. This is our neuroscience uh, MSc students. And, and I was just thinking that, I, that what it, whatever it is that has galvanized them into such extraordinary creative activity, um, it was, I actually genuinely did, I think you were there, Deborah, and say it was it was genuinely remarkable actually mm. um and, and some of the projects were, were quite brilliant yeah what's uh, uh, daisy then come on what's of the projects you've been doing or, or, or watched what's the one that's most maybe not one you thought of but when you've seen students at work what's the one that comes to mind that you think wow that that was just brilliant there was a trial that i worked on a couple of years ago which is looking at postnatal depression which was right. a really interesting challenge because there's not really an adequate clinical solution for postnatal depression at the moment. And we were looking at the concept of singing, because if we look back anthropologically, mothers have been singing to babies across all of human history. And there are even theories that singing developed as a way of mother infant bonding. So we thought, well, is there any chance that singing could help to reduce postnatal depression? And two years later, in a randomized control trial later, we actually found amazing evidence that mothers who engaged in singing programs when they had postnatal depression recovered um, about a month sooner than mothers who didn't. It's about 40% greater improvement in their symptoms. And seeing things like that, that theoretically, of course, makes so much sense and are yeah. things that innately we as humans used to do without having to think about it or justify it. But being able to see so clearly, scientifically, the benefits was absolutely thrilling. I do remember that trial. It was it was brilliant. You also showed the fathers became better singers, didn't you? We, we found that the fathers actually did increase their singing if the mothers increased it. So we were actually seeing that there were these wider knock on behavioral changes within the family. unit. Yes. Well. Yeah. Whether or not they're any good at singing, I don't know. But they certainly did more of it, didn't they? Yes. Well, fortunately, I don't think babies are the most discerning listeners. So I think no, it's, anything goes. It's a relief to us all. <laughs> what about you, Deborah? Come on. What's what? what uh, what thing then recently is has really kind of made you just think, wow, I'm amazed, amazed that we did that or someone did that? Well, I think over the um, over the, the lockdown period, yeah. um, uh, it has been again, actually, I think I'm going to point to singing, too, because um, it is it is something that has been a way of bringing people together. Mm. even while they're apart um, and so I've been stunned and uh, by the the creativity and the endeavors that you know that, that people have put into bringing together virtual choirs and finding ways to continue to sing together 
um, across distance. Um, and uh, it's, it's, there's one in particular which was put together by the excluded, so by um, you know many of whom are, of course, as we know, many many artists and free freelancers in the creative yeah. industries have been excluded from any any um, any income support, um, and they put together a, a piece um, which was really really very moving because you saw simultaneously the terrible plight uh, mm. that they're in, but you also saw the extraordinary skills. Um, that, that that they they bring so so I think I've found I found that um, I found that really moving and and I think I've been as somebody who's had the privilege of, of working alongside or in the arts for so for you know for most of my life really um, perhaps I take it a bit for granted really but to see how people have lent on the arts and how people have found um, have found a comfort purpose um, in the arts and to see the ways that uh, particularly locally based cultural organizations have pivoted in order to really super serve their communities. So they focus not on what they think they are as institutions, but absolutely on what they do. And they've asked the question, what do our communities need right now? And what can we do to support them? Um, so in terms of, of, of mental health and in terms of just a sense of well-being and in terms of educational catch up. Um, and I've found those things really, really inspiring. I mean, Daisy, haven't you got a whole series of amazing natural experiments going on? You know, funerals where you're not allowed to sing or singing where you're not actually allowed to meet. Because I would have, I would have thought, you know, a lot of the benefits you were saying comes from improving your social network. So is it the act of singing or the act of meeting? There's a whole raft of things now, surely, that you are putting in grants to study. She's there are an enough, Simon. <laughs> as part of our work on COVID, the COVID pandemic over the last nine months, yeah. we've been gathering extra question data on people's arts and cultural engagement. And we're starting to go through that now and actually finding these relationships between people's cultural engagement and better coping strategies across the pandemic, which are actually then associated with a greater improvement in mental health over yeah. this period. So we're seeing this relationship playing out in the very unusual circumstances that we're all going through now and we're going to be going into more detail on this to try and look at these distinctions especially around this social versus virtual engagement yes, that yeah. have now had as their new reality. Well, my son got married recently and uh, you know the, the rules are you're not allowed music and so he, he brought in a, a player and was told you can't have that you can't have music you had to explain very slowly that uh, actually it's, it's, you can do that it's just singing which you can't do. And they finally allowed him to switch on uh, the music. So very strange times we live in. Well, what's not strange is that as ever, our time has flown by and um, we covered a huge amount of, uh, of areas and still left some questions to answer. Um, one person was just saying that I think she was slightly, I'm not sure quite the, the point, but, but uh, by using the word social prescribing, are we not medicalizing something that should not be the province of doctors. You know, we should have access to community resources anyway. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing without the intervention of doctors. I'm not sure that's quite fair, but uh... well, I guess the point is, is that if people people can engage in these community activities anyway, but we know there's a social gradient across that participation, and often the people who are less likely to participate are the same ones who are more likely to be experiencing health problems. So the idea with social prescribing is it can be not just saying to someone, "Go and join a book group." but it can be saying, we'll help you through this process to yeah. find something that's suitable, we'll break down these barriers and mean that you can get the same benefits that someone else might be able to get of their own accords. And I, I think, think that's... I, I know we need to, that's a really important point Daisy makes. I mean, access to, to arts and culture is so inequitable. It really is. And actually through social prescribing, you are seeing people who wouldn't normally have the ability for whatever reason to access arts and culture. They are they are getting access. It's a really important point about um, about equity there. Yeah, indeed. So Deborah, then for you, really, um, you wrote a review of the Natalie Portman film Black Swan. I don't. Do you remember that? I do um, indeed. Yes, you said uh, bulimia, self harm, lesbianism, psychological and sexual abuse. Well, it's not like that at the Royal Ballet. So no wonder you left. Um, hopefully, you get all that at Kings. But we are very, very delighted that you have. And Daisy, it's, it's wonderful that you do collaborate with us on, on so many projects because I'm just in awe, in awe of the range and things that you do. I, I just think there's nothing that you can't do, actually. It's just completely yeah, yeah. terrifying. <laughs> now, last bit then. So, let, you know, let, let's have some, uh, 
let's see what you have been uh, advising, as it were. And I don't mean, you know, get more sleep, uh, more exercise, don't listen to the news. But what kind of things have you stumbled across or one thing have you picked up during COVID, apart from a decent bottle of wine, of course, um, that we've been talking about that you would say now is good for your mood? I noticed you discussed this in the standard, uh, Deborah. Can you remember what you recommended? <laughs> well, I've, really I've, I've, I've gone back to my piano. So I, I learned piano when I was ooh, maybe 12 to 14, 15 and then stopped. But I've gone back to it and that gives me, um, gives me a lot of joy. And I combine that with getting back on my exercise bike. So uh -huh. not simultaneously, that would be really clever. OK, and Daisy? Well, I've been loving watching all of the singing from balconies and street choirs that have been forming. So I'm hoping we might have some collective socially distanced carol singing over the next month from people's <laughs> windows and doorways. It's okay. allowed. It's allowed. <laughs> this is allowed, yes. Is, right, yeah. now a little, little bit, me quick bit of housekeeping for everyone to remind everyone our next public lecture will be on Monday, February the 8th. The title is Robotic Surgery. What can it do for surgeons? I imagine turn on their CDs, in fact, uh, Daisy, and help you with your next research programme. However, no, it's going to be given by Professor Roger Nebo, beautifully named, and uh, Chris Peters. It's, uh, Roger is indeed an extraordinary character, and uh, he's been just speaking only last week at the City and Guilds Art School on surgery and art and craft, so continuing the RSM tradition of crossing boundaries. So do come in for that one, February, May the 8th. And of course, our normal COVID series continues tomorrow. Now, tomorrow, Thursday, and our in conversation is tomorrow and all the other things that we do. So back to you two. Thank you so much for giving up an hour of your evening. And uh, I just do hope that uh, I still think that, that there's still no substitute for real singing, real drama, real theater, real opera together in person and that the virtual world will never, ever, ever come to come close to that kind of experience. Um, I'm, I'm just certain of it. I don't think you need to research that, uh, Daisy. I think it's true. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Take care.